One of the greatest things that God could hear from you and I, think about it, is for you and I to say to him or ask of him, Lord, show me your glory. The glory of God, it's, look, it's legendary throughout all of human existence that the glory of God, think about the glory of God, the Bible says, that led Israel out of Egypt into the promised land, the glory of God. The Bible tells us about the glory of God appearing at the temple when Solomon had finished it off. The glory of God. Well, listen, we have the glory of God and the word of God today. So Jack, I wanna see a, a glowing cloud. I wanna see a burning bush. Listen, I understand where you're coming from. I remember requesting or wanting to see the same thing, but I don't anymore because this book, the Bible, reveals more of his glory than I can handle. In fact, 66 books, the Bible, 66 books penned by 40 different authors spanning a time frame of about 1,500 to 1,800 years. And most of the authors, earthly authors, that is, who were possessed by the Holy Spirit, according to the Bible, didn't even know each other. Many of them did not know each other. In fact, some of them were not even on the same continent. And yet this book from cover to cover, spanning really life, and eternity has one key star player in it, and that is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So you can take every chapter, every verse, every book of the Bible and find Christ in it from Genesis to Revelation. Any book of the Bible, some will even say any chapter of the Bible, and you'll find Christ. Well, my friends, I believe that we are, as this book says, the Bible, the inerrant word of God, the very will of God revealed to us. So let's read it and let's expect God to show us his glory. In Jesus' name, let's dive in. There's an account in Exodus 33. It's beautiful, you can read it later. God has called Israel out of Egypt. God is speaking to Moses. And Moses is on Mount Sinai and they're conversing. And Moses brings up the challenge. God, you've been telling me all this stuff and this is fantastic. But I need to tell the people who is sending me. And there's that famous talk that you've read about. And he tells them, I am sent you. So you go down and you tell them that the great self-contained eternal one who has no beginning and no ending is sending you guys out of Egypt and into the promised land. And you would think that that's enough. Moses sees the burning bush. He hears God's voice. He sees the afterglow. But isn't it amazing, Moses presses the envelope, and I'm glad he did. Moses, like any curious kid, would say, and I think, God, I've got to tell you, I think God smiled, I think God, his heart got warm, when Moses said in Exodus chapter 33, verse 18, please, show me your glory. Show me your glory. And that word glory is amazing. That word means essence. Look at the meaning of the word in Hebrew. Show me your essence, he's asking me. I want to know the essence of who you are. Your matter, as in weighty. Who you are behind the veil. Who are you? All this is fantastic, but I've got to know you personally. The one who's behind it all. The one who is abounding. You who is honored. You who is fierce. I like that because it's not a fierceness to attack you. It's a fierceness to defend you. I love that. The one that's immovable. Show me your glory. So church, as we look at this, we are going to be ending this portion of scripture with a grand hope and understanding that God has for us glory in the end. You might want to mark this down if you would. That's not an Old Testament argument alone. First John 2 verses 2 and 3. It's a beautiful thing uh, to want the glory of God. I personally believe, I may be wrong, but I personally believe that every true Christian, how, how do you know if somebody's a true Christian? I think every true Christian has the constant abiding inside of themselves longing for glory meaning God's presence. If you knew today that you could have God's presence, would you take it? Would you go for it? 
Listen, God says this in the Bible, beloved, now we are children of God and it has not been yet revealed what we shall be like, but we know that when he is revealed, that is when he comes, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. What is the hope? That Christ is coming back and we are going to be with him. How does that affect us? We live for him now. Listen, the true Christian longs to be with God in heaven. Don't get me wrong. I don't have some death wish. I'm not saying let's end it now. What I'm saying is God has numbered our days and we're going to live those days until he calls us home. That's the Christian heart. So we want to make the best of our days for God. And that's going to make for a thrilling life, by the way. Think about all the things that God has given you in life. And whatever that thing is, God says, all that I've given you is to have you, through this life I've given you, advance the hope of glory, the hope of salvation, the hope of eternal life, to tell other people, to let them know. And when you think about that, it's quite remarkable. Who are we talking about? is sharing forever with Jesus. And I'm talking about the Jesus of the Bible. Colossians chapter two, verse nine. Very powerful verse. Colossians two, verse nine, regarding Jesus Christ. It says, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. Did you know that? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But God revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ the Son. Listen, when Jesus spoke the Sermon on the Mount, one of the beautiful things he said was the Mount, or on the Mount of Beatitudes, he gave, uh, blessed, blessed are you, blessed, and he says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. A good theologian right now is going to stop and say, wait a minute, what does that really mean? It means exactly what Jesus says it means. Yeah, but how is that going to happen? Because there's God the Father and God the Son, I get that, but how are you going to see God the Spirit? And that's a good question. We don't know how it's going to happen, except this. When you arrive into heaven, you're going to see the glory of God, and the glory of God is going to see God in his totality. How will we see the Spirit, the Son, and the Father? I don't know, but we will. That ought to freak you out for a good while. That ought to get you excited. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And that is the totality of who he is. In the meantime, Christ came into this world to reveal God to us. That God became flesh and came into this world. I'm indebted to um, our friend Eric Metaxas, who gave us this quote when he was here last. And it's in his book, uh, Letter to the American Church. But um, it's a quote from Abraham Kuyper, and I'd never heard it before, and I, but I love it. There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. And I like that. That's scriptural because the Bible says in Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Think about that. With all that's going on in the world, by the way, friends, listen, you may be upset with what's happened in the world. You're not more upset than God is. God's hurt. His heart's broken over all the horrible things that are taking place in the world. He said, why don't you do something about it? He did something about it. He's doing something about it, and he's going to do something about it. He's made that very clear in his Bible. But when we look around and we see the things that are going on, understand this. God is presiding over it all. And according to the scriptures, things are working to a very specific time and place, an intersection, almost like in geometry or in some form of artwork where these two things intersect or they come to a point of infinite meeting where these two separates come together and in distance over time become one. God knows exactly what he's doing. The Bible also says, and I love this, please mark it, in Acts chapter 4, verse 11, and I'm going to read from Acts 4, 11, and then I'm going to jump to Philippians 2, verse 7, because they go together so beautifully. And talk about the glory of God. Mark this down. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders. This is Peter speaking on uh, the day that he's preaching at the southern steps there in Jerusalem. 
which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other. What a statement. Acts 4.12 says, you can't be saved without Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? The Bible's so narrow-minded. Well, the Bible's not narrow-minded, but is the Bible narrow? Yes. How many times do you want God to come into this world and die on a cross? Well, he's only going to do it once. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's crystal clear. Philippians 2, verse 7. Who, coming in the likeness of men or mankind, and being found in appearance as a man, a human, that's a huge statement just there. Are you guys with me? Yeah. Philippians 2, 7 already tells you that Jesus, in essence, was not a human. He was God. It was a big deal for him to come into this world and become a man. What a wild, awesome thing. Verse 8, and being found in the appearance uh, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even to the death of the cross. Friends, none of us humble ourselves to the point of death. <laughs> We're going to die. We don't choose to die. We die. Jesus chose to die. What an argument. Verse 9, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. I hope you've done that. Of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, the spirit realm. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the what? Glory of God the Father. Blaise Pascal said this, Not only do we not know God except through Jesus Christ, we do not even know ourselves except through Jesus Christ. What an awesome statement. The, the great reformer Martin Luther said this, and I love this quote by the way. He said, I feel as if Jesus Christ died only yesterday. You think about that statement for a moment. Whatever's going on in your life, keep this in mind. Luther, who was sold out to religion and to all of the requirements of the Catholic Church, was their star monk in all that he was doing and whatever monks do. He was the guy, and then he started pondering and thinking and reading the Bible for himself. And he came to the conclusion, wait a minute, it's not about religion. It's about knowing Jesus personally. And his understanding of scripture transformed the world. It transformed your life. You here, you may have never even heard of Martin Luther, but that great reformer, that German theologian transformed the direction of the Western world and that forever. Why? He went right back to the Bible, just the Bible and set him free. And when he says, I feel as if Jesus Christ died only yesterday, I have to say amen to that. God wants you and I to experience a relationship with him that is so active and current that it's as though Jesus died yesterday. It's as though he just left. And oh, by the way, it seems as though he's coming back soon. You say, Jack, how, can you, how do you say that? Because listen, the believer, Christ now lives inside the believer's heart. We walk, we do, we work, we eat, we sleep. It's a life now that is controlled by Jesus. Friends, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to know what I'm talking about. That God wants you to throw your life wide open to him and say, come on, just have me come in. Have me take over. I'm your creator, I'm your designer, I'm your architect, I'm the one that loves you. And open up the, the doors of your heart and I'll come in. And you know what? You'll walk with Jesus on a day-to-day -day basis, day in, day out. Listen, he'll never leave you. Once you open up your heart, your life, he comes in, you'll know it, and he'll never leave you. You'll never, ever again feel like you're lonely. In fact, as look, believers know what I'm about to say. As a Christian, now we try to find an opportunity to get alone. We want to be alone because when we're alone, we're with him. He'll never leave you or forsake you, says the Bible. Why? Because he's got a desire to bring you into glory. He died on the cross for the sins of the entire world. He said, well, I don't believe. Listen, I understand that. He still died for you. If you don't go to heaven, that's your business. But he wants you there. He wants you to experience his glory. 
And if I can stand at the base of a mighty waterfall and feel so insignificant as the roar of all of that water comes crashing down and you, you, you just feel like you're like a flea compared to the power of that water. What about God when he shakes the earth or God when he speaks? Or what about when the heavens part and Christ returns? It's gonna happen, people. And when it does, will it be a joyous moment for you or will it be a terrifying moment for you? God wants you to have it to be a glorious moment for you. We're talking about a transformation of your entire life from the inside out. No church can do this. No denomination can do this. A pastor, a priest, a pope cannot do this. It's got to be between you and Jesus. And so, yes, Luther, I agree. It's as though Jesus only died and rose again from the dead yesterday. Why? Because he's so close. He is so close. And so this is our third and final installment, and we'll be done. It's this. Don't just look at it, enjoy it. See, what do you mean? Don't just look at your salvation. Just don't look at the Bible and all of the things that it says and those wonderful verses and passages and all of those incredible accounts of great feats of faith. Enjoy it. You know, somewhere along the line, I'll flub it up somehow, but if I remember somewhat correctly, the, the Westminster Shorter Catechism says something to the effect, what is man's chief purpose? Man's chief purpose is to know God and to enjoy him forever. God wants you to enjoy him. And he calls us heirs. To be an heir means that you are left something from someone who's, who first of all has something. Okay, if you don't have anything, you don't have any heirs. You may have people in your life, but you can't give them anything. Lisa's got a teacup collection. I remember some years ago, we had a living trust made up. And uh, the issue on like page nine is the teacups. <laughs> For real. Who, who gets the teacups? And I didn't have any input. I just, I didn't. You, you can talk to the attorney about your teacups because I don't care who gets them. Why? They have no value to me. I don't care about those things. She does. Okay, but I do have a perfect 1967 <laughs> Volkswagen from Wolfsburg, Germany that's in perfect condition. It, it won at the Steve McQueen car show. I've had it since I was about 19 years old, 20 years old. It's the cutest thing in the world. Gets about 1,000 miles to a gallon. It's quite remarkable. <laughs> um, now, when the attorney said, now, who, what, who, who gets that? Now, now we're talking about an heir. <laughs> okay. Lisa, she's like, she tunes out. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. What's the, what's the plans? And whichever one of my grandkids walks on water first gets the bug. <laughs> Listen, you got to have something to give it away. Are you with me? God says, how much, <laughs> how much do I have? God, you have, you're everything. And this is what I'm going to give to you. And not only you, he says your joint heir is with Christ. Okay, this is, I'm going to give you the theology of it, but I don't have the faith to wrap my mind and heart around it. I don't get it. I just know it's true. God the Father has bestowed upon his son post-resurrection to be the recipient of all that God has. In that, though, is that he represents all of us who believe. Jesus receives from his Father the resurrected Christ, the God-man. Jesus receives from his Father, and the Father and the Son both now extend it to us, the believer. And here's what's really good about it. If I had a $100 bill and I said, okay, you guys, get, you guys get to inherit this. Knock yourself out. By the time you got to it, you'd get like a quarter of a penny of it with the people that are in this group, just this service. Are you with me? Because it's a little bit, you're going to wind up with even less because it's distributed evenly among all. Hallelujah. People get excited. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that the kingdom that Christ brings to us is not divvied up. Here, you get this much, and then you get this much. No, 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 no. Each individual who trusts Christ, whose name is written down in the Lamb Book of Life, receives all that Christ has received from the Father. 
No wonder why the Bible says he gives us eternal life. It's going to be amazing. Show me your glory. What a request. I think God wants you and I to say, God, show me your glory. Jacob grabbed on to the angel of the Lord and said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. That's a great request. How about you and I getting so desperate before God that we say, God, I'm not leaving until you reveal your glory in the situation in which I'm living in right now. This marriage, this business, this finance, this sickness, whatever it is. So listen, bottom line is this, it's about eternal life. And the key about eternal life is the glory of God. Listen, wrapped up in eternal life is this glorious gift that God gives us. For God so loved the world that he technically gifted to us his eternal son. Jesus is the believer's inheritance. Can you imagine what's in store for us who are gonna to go to heaven to be in God's forever family and what eternity must be like? It's not gonna be boring, I'll tell you that right now. It's gonna be absolutely awesome. Are there not awesome places in this world to enjoy sunset, ocean crashing against the rocks, an incredible meadow or the mountains. These things in this fallen world are just the hint of what's coming our way. But God has promised us eternal life. But listen, you must receive the gift. It cost him everything to give you a free gift. But because it's free, it's not cheap. But by receiving that gift of eternal life, what Jesus did at the cross, he died for me. I'm just gonna pick on me right now, okay? But you. Hang on too. He died for my sins, my wickedness, my pride, my lust, my anger, my hatred, all of my sin. Jesus died there for Jack and he rose again from the dead for Jack. Now insert your name, my friend. If you make that decision today, tell God about it right now. Lord, I'm making that decision. I'm trusting in you right now. And I'm doing that in Jesus name. Listen, always go to jackhibbs.com to find out more information there, Facebook, Instagram, various media platforms there. But always, we would love to hear from you. And please, jackhibbs.com, you'll find many more resources there to strengthen your walk with Jesus Christ. God bless you. You are watching Real Life with Jack Hibbs. How can we move beyond the superficial and step into a deeper relationship with God? By learning to pursue Him. A.W. Tozer teaches us how to do that in his insightful book, The Pursuit of God, a Christian classic that's influenced the lives of millions of believers for decades. Contrasting the saints of the Bible who long to see more of God's glory with the stubbornly content Christians of today, Tozer reignites a yearning to go beyond the surface and experience a profound closeness with the Lord. Unravel the secrets of a more intimate relationship with the Creator in this time-tested masterpiece. You can receive The Pursuit of God when you make a gift of any amount this month to the Ministry of Real Life with Jack Hibbs. Get your copy by going online to jackhibbs.com or by calling 877-777-2346. Order now. Life is full of fear, doubt, and worry. The more you listen to and see the world today, the easier it is to feel hopeless and helpless. Amidst the confusion, a voice of hope has emerged. The Real Life Network. Founded by Jack Hibbs, the Real Life Network is a free digital media platform, void of the noise of secular media that attack people of faith. Click on the QR code or sign up for free at reallifenetwork.com. Fast forward your faith. Welcome to Real Life Radio with Jack Hibbs. God's Word never will return void. God's Word is spirit, it's power, and it has its effect. God did not give us Bible prophecy to scare us, but to prepare us. You are the light of the world, Jesus said. You are the salt of the earth. How does that happen? Jack Hibbs truly believes we are living in some of the most exciting days in history which brings some great opportunities to share with the world a powerful, no-nonsense presentation of the gospel to this generation who are searching for answers and truth. Will you stand with us 
in sharing this message in real and practical ways. We ask that you commit to support Real Life and the teachings of Jack Hibbs with a gift of your choosing. Simply go to jackhibbs.com. And there you can simply follow the instructions of how to give a one-time gift or a recurring gift. If you would prefer to call, our toll-free number is 877-777-2346. Again, that's 877-777-2346. And of course, you can write us. Our address is Real Life with Jack Hibbs, Box 1273, Chino Hills, California, 91709. Your gift will be faithfully put to work because it's our desire that through Jesus Christ, you will know real life.